wall to, to secure the border. The, the border has many different dynamics. If you look at Tucson, Arizona, there is no river. If you look at McAllen, Texas, um, there's, there's a large river. Um, the, the cartels, they use the different terrain features. They use the different specific areas. Laredo, Texas, they use a lot of the, uh, the commercial to do their smuggling because they're going to use what is available at the time, the resources that they have. And that's what we see, and that's why we have to, I, I agree um, with Ms. Garza, we have to have a holistic approach. There's got to be a look at everything that we, that we do, but enforcement is absolutely a necessary issue in this process. And if we don't have the enforcement, then we're going to continue to see the chaos that we're currently seeing. Thanks for what you're doing. My time has expired. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Now recognize uh, Mr. Vizi for his five minutes of questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Garza, I, I, I don't know the, the Koch brothers. I've never met them. I know that a lot of my Republican colleagues around the table have met them and dealt with them and been supported by them. And because of your work in the nonprofit world, you probably are familiar with Cato Institute and know that they founded that organization. And there is a, a very interesting report, if you haven't read it, that, that talks about this issue. 97% um, uh, of, of, of ports are less likely uh, to be stopped than are people illegally crossing between them. One of the reasons why we see people going to these ports is because they know that, they're, that, they're, that drugs are less likely to be searched there. And so it's only logical that that these people that are bringing fentanyl in these countries would go through these ports. Uh, just 0.2% of the people arrested by Border Patrol for crossing illegally possess any fentanyl uh, whatsoever. Uh, and contrary to what Mr. Judd uh, just told us, uh, we know that the government exacerbated the problem by banning most legal uh, cross-border traffic in 2020 and 2021, uh, accelerating the switch uh, to fentanyl and that during the travel restrictions, fentanyl seizures at ports quadrupled uh, from fiscal year 2019 to 2021. Fentanyl went from a third uh, of combined heroin and fentanyl seizures uh, uh, to over 90%, and annual deaths from fentanyl doubled from 2019 until 2021 after the government banned most travel and asylum. So it's, it's pretty logical and obvious where the drugs are coming from. And so I want to ask you, uh, how has a, a, a militarized border affected these communities, especially knowing that the drugs aren't coming in through their communities? And I just want to say for the record, Mr. Chairman, I've been to the border many times and have visited McAllen for a variety of different reasons over, for, over the last 18 years. And this is probably one of the safest communities I've ever been in in the entire state of Texas. I'm from Fort Worth. Please. I, I just... I want to start with the fact that I'm a fifth generation Tejana from Brownsville, Texas. And it is one of the safest communities. I'm raising my 10 month old daughter here intentionally. It is not what is, is depicted in the media. This is not a war zone. It is a very safe community. It's a very welcoming community. And, and unfortunately we are on the eve of, of some fiestas that are happening in Brownsville, the, the celebration of the relationship between Brownsville and Matamoros that is incredibly unique. It's a celebration of the relationship between the United States and Mexico, of our, of, of our intertwined economies, of our families, of our culture, of our language. And to have a hearing like this that isn't focused on the needs of border communities, we need infrastructure. We need dollars for health care. We don't need a militarized zone. We have all kinds of enforcement in this region and it has done nothing to stem the flow of drugs. Operation Lone Star has spent billions of dollars in this region as I laid out in my testimony and it has not resulted in reductions of deaths that you are seeing in your communities in the interior of the United States. So throwing more money into militarizing this region is not gonna solve the problem. We need to address this as a public health issue, and we need to treat immigrants that are seeking protection in this country humanely. And we need, to, we, need to, we need to take care of that part because the people in this community are stepping up even though they are impoverished. We are still standing up and, and helping out the, these folks that are coming and looking for, for protection in our country. No, uh, thank you. In, in Mr. Judd's opening statement, he made a comment that he didn't know exactly why why the undocumented are, are coming here. 
And um, I would like to remind Mr. Judd and everybody sitting around this table, not just him, that uh, the reason why they're coming here and the reason why they are, are here, they're primarily taking jobs that are very hard to fill in this country. And so all of us should remember that the next time we put food on our table, that that food was probably uh, picked or harvested or produced by people that were undocumented. The next time we put gas, we talk about Texas being the oil and gas capital of the world, the next time we put gas in our car. And so that, that, that's what they're doing. I just wanted to answer Mr. Judd's question because he said that he did not know uh, what they were doing here. And I'm telling you what they're doing here. We're all eating tonight because of them. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. Now I recognize uh, Mr. Latta for his five minutes of questions. Well, thank you much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for holding this hearing.